Welcome to this month's You and Hellion on the topic of religion. And we'll begin with Anno Ka, my teacher, with Church of the Sacrament. His You and Hellion on religion will be read by me, yours truly, because Anno has lost his voice. And, um, yeah. And his You and Hellion will be followed by Skaka Thomas and Emily Oram. And then Lalita from back east and then mine, and then Mike Marinucci, author of California Jesus. And then at the end, we'll share a little bit more about the December you and Hellion, and um, yeah, and a little bit of encouragement to submit yours, because this is an open mic ministry, so your response video for what religion means to you can be posted in the comment section of this. So sit back and enjoy the you and Hellion. I am honored to have my brother Kelly read my words as I am dealing with the loss of my voice. This open mic ministry is conceived to be a new style of church, and we should have a new definition, a new understanding of religion. So I offer the following for your contemplation as you design and articulate your own personal religion. Religion defined. A religion is the actual set of ideas and practices that guides an individual's thoughts and actions. We each have a set of fundamental understandings that form the basis for what we believe reality to be. For the most part, we never actually try to articulate for ourselves what these understandings are. We kind of accept a generalized idea without really analyzing the story or the ramifications. If a religion is the actual set of ideas and practices that guides an individual's thoughts and actions, then essential to the formation of a constructive religion is one's definition of an individual. What are you or what am I? Or I would add, who are you? Who am I? Isn't it the most important question that we need to have an answer to if we are going to be able to properly live a life? I am a human being. A human being is an individual. An individual is a unique point of awareness endowed with the powers of attention, volition, and intelligence. An individual. The ultimate experience of being an individual is that you feel you as different from my I. When I think about chocolate and peanut butter, it is my mouth that waters. When I asked my fingers to type these words, your fingers did not leap into action. On some level, a fundamental aspect of my experience of a self is that sense of my I as being separate from your I. Unique. Not only is my I separate and distinct from your I, it is also true that we are unique from one to the other. This can be approached from several different angles. We think different thoughts, express different genes, but let us just deal with time and space. At this moment, you are where you are, and I am where I am. Never will we ever be in the exact same place at the exact same time. We will always be experiencing a perspective that is completely our own. Even if we each started off as the exact same thing by the act of individuation in time and space, we have guaranteed that each individual would be a unique crystallization of that prime awareness. Point of awareness. This is probably the most essential aspect of my definition of an individual. We are each a point of awareness. 
At this moment, you are aware of your computer, your phone, the room you're in, the building in which the room resides, the people in the building, people in the same city, the world. Right now, you are aware of such an incredible collection of data that it would be impossible to list them all. And it is this stream of awareness that we call life. Endowed. There is that which is you, which is I. I exist and I have ability and power. Volition. The ability to willfully direct one's attention. Attention. The power of directed awareness. Intelligence. The ability to order towards a goal. And this is where Ono ties, ties it all up. A human being is an individual. An individual is a unique point of awareness, endowed with the powers of volition, attention, and intelligence. Okay, what does this definition tell us? If each of us is an unique expression of some universal something, then the single most essential activity for each is to express that which only we can express. To explore and manifest that aspect of us that only we can bring into existence. To make manifest our uniqueness. This is my definition of an individual. Therefore, the religion that I am constructing for myself to live by prioritizes supporting others so that they might find their own means towards self-actualization. And in quotes he wrote, uh, Funny enough, it is the very manner in which I assist my brothers and sisters that most reflects my uniqueness. End quote. We each make choices every day. How do we evaluate between our options? How do we discern what is best for us, for each of us, to do at any moment? Whatever system we have in place to assist us in this choice is our religion. I invite you to truly examine what is the basis behind your personal religion. Namaste. 1123-5843-7189-8876-4156-2819. Hello, I'm Love Coach Kaka Thomas. And I'm Love Coach Emily Oram. And we're here to talk about religion. And I think the first thing that we wanted to just differentiate is the difference between religion and spirituality. And uh, my understanding is that as we are entering the Aquarian age and leaving the Piscean age, to the Piscean age, overall, we felt the need to get to God through an institution, through a religion, through Jesus or through Mohammed or through the prophet. Um, in the Aquarian age, we are creating our own direct connection to God, our own direct connection to source. And I think most of the people who are going to watch this, most of the people in our tribe, have gone through a disassociation and disconnection from the organized religion that they were raised with. Probably because they saw the hypocrisy, probably because they saw the institutional part of it, and because there's this deep longing for our own direct connection to God and source. One last thing I'll mention, and then turn it over to my partner here, is that um, if you really study the roots of the Christian church, and most of us were probably raised in the Christian tradition, um, the Christian church was primarily founded by converted Romans. And so they had that very romantic, conquer the world attitude. And so the Catholic church really figured out how can we conquer the world through this religion. Um, and in that process, there was a tremendous amount of shame. The whole focus being Jesus died for your sins. He suffered on the cross, tortured and crucified for your sins. 
whoa, I mean, that's just pretty, you know, we're, we're honoring a guy who was tortured and crucified for our sins. And then the whole idea, which was nothing that Jesus actually said, if you read the Gospel of Thomas, which are actually direct quotes from Jesus, there's nothing in there about hell. Um, but the whole idea that uh, if we don't go through the church and do what the church tells us to do, we're going to be bad and we're going to go to hell. But if we're good little boys and girls, we get to go to heaven. Which again, most of us realized early on, that's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so... I think what I've really seen the most um, out of coming out of organized religion is really adopting a, kind of a martyr-based paradigm, <laughs> right? Like I have to suffer, put myself last, I have to submit to be good, um, I have to, you know, right my wrongs. And there's just a lot of shame that we take on and we criticize ourselves. And the more that we do that, we tend to do that to everybody around us. And that was created as basically a source of manipulation for mm -hmm. control and power and punishment and better than, less than, all of these themes that we see that are so rampant in our society and how much pain and suffering that they're, they're causing. And so many of us are really uh, committed to breaking out of that, breaking out of that by redefining ourselves. Um, who are we, what is important to us, obviously acknowledging the consequences of our behavior, but not from a place of, of shame, from a place of compassion, understanding. And these principles, I think, at the heart of spirituality in many religions are the roots mm -hmm. of what the teachings are. Love, compassion, understanding, um, unity, coming together, com communion. And, and communion really starts, I think, in a large way with, with ourself, mm. with really communing with what works for us, what are our higher values, what are the values of, of love that we really aspire to and that we adhere to, and how can we align that within ourselves and whatever that means to us, and then through that, bring that, those virtues, bring those qualities of being out into the world. I think for me what stands out in what she said especially was what, however that means to us and really appreciating Kelly Guava and, and the several events that we did there and we did a lot of um, events that were of a spiritual nature but very open, you know, and so I love that in our tribe we're not... Dogmatic. Exactly. It's not <laughs> about a dogma and promoting a dogma, it's about... Uh, coming together in communi community and, hey, how are you learning about love? What are the lessons of love? How can we share more love? Uh, but it's based on more of a, an experience than a dogma. I know even in vulnerability, when I first met Scott, I had very clear teachings of what worked for me to connect to my higher self or God or spirit. There's so many names for God. And I remember <clears throat> when we were bringing that to our classes, Scott was like, wow, I really see that these are the ways that work for you, but let's also open up the field to help people to connect to what, what that is for them. Mm -hmm. And it really opened my perspective and re recognized that what works for one person may not work for somebody else. And there's nothing right or wrong about that. It's actually a blessing to be able to know that we're, we're all different. We all have what works for us. How can we use those differences as a way to get curious and to celebrate the diversity of beingness, mm. which I feel like is what's connecting us to our roots. Mm. If you look at everything around you, we are a colorful melting pot of diversity, culturally, um, belief system wise. And I think most of the pain and suffering is because we've created a right wrong about, about all of that. Instead of learning to embrace our differences, through the power of curiosity and understanding. Ooh. So. I think uh, the last piece we want to talk about is our own personal relationship to God's source. And um, I'm really grateful that probably one of the most important parts of my life is that I have a very strong faith. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah. I have a deep belief that ultimately it's all good. And ultimately I'm protected, I'm supported, even if I die, you know, the body will die, but the spirit moves on. And, and I've been blessed to have non-drug-induced 
multi-dimensional experiences, meaning I've actually experienced myself in the astral world, I've experienced myself in alternate realities, in what we would call historical uh, past or future. I've experienced that, and so I believe it. And so it's given me this incredible faith, which I'm really grateful for. And I think a, a big part of why Emily and I have done really well together uh, is that at the core, we both have a strong sense of faith. And I'd love for you to talk about your beautiful relationship mm. to God. <clears throat> well, for me, I think the conduit of what connects me to my higher self or God is usually the power of my heart and love. And allowing myself to come to those places, sometimes it's actually moving through pain, moving through fear, but surrendering through that experience to the power of humility, grace, and love. And that's actually a very kinesthetic, emotional experience for me. And then through that, through that feeling, that connection to myself, I'm able to literally imagine myself expanding out into the field of, again, like feeling the field around me, expanding and, and feeling my, um, that I'm way beyond the body, that there is an essence, a grace, a, an energy life force that is running this ship <laughs> way more. The force is with you. <laughs> way more than my little pea brain can even imagine. And when I'm able to actually get into those places of surrender, which is usually that feeling those beautiful feelings and breaking myself open to, to love and awe. Awe is a really big one for me. The feeling of awe and wonder breaks me usually open and love breaks me open to grace. And then there's this experience of like, wow, there is, I'm so much more supported and guided than I could ever imagine. Mm -hmm. And um, it's this just, reverence is is really the the word that comes to mind reverence humility and grace that permeates my body and permeates this knowing um, and it's quite an exquisite place to live and I really my desire is to bring that as much as possible into my daily life so that I can remember that and I'm not living in that kind of lower fear state in conclusion we really try and incorporate this into our relationship we start every day with prayer um, and prayer is sometimes affirmations, it's sometimes listening in. Yes, I know it's nine minutes. Um, so uh, may you also cultivate, those of you who are watching, celebrate the ways that you cultivate faith and spirit. And thanks for giving us this chance to talk about it. Thank you. Hello, Open Mic Ministry. I am Lalita. Thank you, Ono, for inviting me. So I guess I'm going to talk about religion. I might have to take some deep breaths throughout this. <laughs> kind of an intense topic. Um, you know, one of the things that cracks me up is that we become so politically correct and maybe, you know, in, in a good way trying to be inclusive that we often say, well, it doesn't, you know, there's so many paths to God and it's all the same God. And um, my friend Kai told me a long time ago, he's like, actually, the paths to God aren't all that different. If you look at, you know, you pray, you do this, you dance, you sing, you read. Um, he's like, but the gods that these religions paint are actually quite different. So I think that's true. I think that each religion really paints a different picture of what God, God, Goddess, universe, all of that is. And um, for me in particular, I've been studying classical Tantra for 10 years. So... For me, God is everything and nothing, um, the universe in, in the grandest scheme and in every you know, molecule in my body. Um, it's a non-dual perspective, so I believe it's all oneness and really like awareness birthing itself into creation through our human bodies in order to know itself. So um, with that being said, um, I have kind of an interesting family configuration. Um, I am a uh, tantrika, <laughs> and my mother is an atheist, and my father turned born-again Christian about 10 years ago, and my parents are married. So it's been a very interesting, interesting dynamic to talk about, you know, obviously my dad or most born again Christians are, you know, really horrified that um, their friends, their family, people they love, if they don't accept Jesus uh, as their savior, that they're going to go to hell. 
and and so you know it's understandable that so many people feel really desperate to uh, spread the word <laughs> so with my dad though it's been like look it's never gonna happen dad it's never ever gonna happen and um, you know here's why he, he, he's like well he's so funny because in the same breath he can say uh, Christians don't judge anybody and those ones that do they're not real Christians and he's like then I'll be like but hey you know your grandma she says she's born again but I, I don't know if she really is and I'm like oh that kind of sounds like a judgment you know and he's you know talking about the Catholics they'll really tell you about who isn't Christian and that's what he, he grew up as um, and I said dad do you not see that you're judging you're saying that everybody who hasn't accept Jesus you're judging them as not worthy to enter heaven or wherever and so he he's kind of gets it but you know whatever um, and so in the last couple of years it's been interesting because this, uh, as my father is becoming that I'm becoming what I am and even more so I'm becoming where, very aware of how damaging I believe Christianity is and has been to society at large and the world at large um, for a couple of reasons and it's not the only one I could pick on any of the religions but this is the one I have the most um, personal experience with so Essentially, um, let's see, um, <clears throat> I think that any religion that has a very intense mechanism for sexual repression um, and who puts the church as a huge authority um, is causing a lot of problems in our society. Um, so for example, um, <clears throat> Many people, um, their first experience of sexuality is when they're a baby or quite young and it's usually that they're self-pleasuring or masturbating. And even some rather evolved parents kind of freak out when they see this. And so, and, and many of them who are religious, who are like, whoa, masturbation, bad, right? They, um, they're like, no, and they, they, just, they just, like, they tell the kid that's not okay, they, might shame them, they might say, hey, you know, like, not okay with God kind of thing. And so the first message we get around our sexuality in that case is not only that sex is bad, but that that first impulse you had to follow your own pleasure, um, that you can't trust that. And actually, because of that and how strong those impulses are, you probably can't trust yourself about anything. And from there on out, you know, you're, you're taught that you must defer either to your parents, to religion, or the government to... Um, you know, like, <clears throat> um, know how to do anything in life, know how to build a society, got to follow these rules. <sighs> so I'm not super into that. Um, the reason, and just so you know, my mom said I could choose my own religion at a very young age. And so I, um, I took that seriously. And I went to a lot of different churches. I studied world religions in college. But it really wasn't until I was about mm, 28 or so that um, Tantra arrived in my life. And you know I started reading the philosophy and the text and the practices. And it all made a lot of sense to me. And it's really primarily because it's a non-dual religion. And it's the only path that I'm aware of that holds a two-fold path and that it's celebrating both spiritual liberation and worldly success and pleasure and enjoyment. Um, there's a lot more to say about that, but I think this is the end of my time. So thank you, and if you want to hear more of my thoughts, please visit LalitaDiaz.com. Bye. Religion. <laughs> For me, growing up, religion was going to church. Conservative Baptist church, five days a week, Christian school, K through 11, reading your Bible every day, washing your mind with the water of the word, as, they, as we were taught, which is mind washing. Christian wouldn't say brainwashing, right? Mind washing. Uh, you got to stay in fellowship, go to church, you know, tithe, you know, all these things, you know, so you stay plugged in so you don't fall away, right? And uh, no sin, you know. No uh, sex, no outside of marriage, no masturbation, you know, all, in, a secret sin, oh my God, the demons of hell will come and get you. All these things um, designed to keep me plugged in. And, uh, and I did that. I did it really, really well. And 
It just doesn't serve me anymore. Yeah. The Bible is the inherent, perfect Word of God. King James Version, of course. Never mind about King James, how, how uh, about what a terrible man he was, we were taught. You know, it's uh, the Holy Spirit decided which books win the Bible, and and uh, and it's the Holy Spirit, you know, that helps you understand and 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 to know. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit, which of course only through Jesus, um, then you don't get it, you know. And you're chosen ahead of time, you know. Who's gonna be a Christian? Who's not? You know. There's that predestination thing, and once saved, always saved, eternal security. You know, my mother hangs on to that one. Bless her heart. I get it. I get it, you know. But, uh, yeah, it just doesn't serve me anymore. All of that. You know, and God, my concept of God, creator, all-knowing, knows me better than myself. And the highest form of love as a Christian, I was taught, was to put God between me and myself, me and relationships, dreams, everything I did, just everything. And, of course through the filter of the Bible, as King James decided what went in there. I mean, never mind about the Book of Thomas or Mary Magdalene or anything else, you know, uh, especially a woman, right? So anyway, oh, but there's a Book of Esther. Oh, yeah, okay, Book of Esther's in the Old Testament. Yeah, but what I didn't find in the Old or the New Testament was self-love and loving myself has absolutely blown the doors off of my life experience. It's been it's been a big deal. I mean, a lot was shamed. I was shamed. Uh, I shame. I was raised ashamed myself. Um, I don't know that all Christians went through that, but I sure I did. Um, sex is shamed. Everything's shamed. Um, yeah, it was it was heavy, heavy shit, and now my concept of God is I believe there's there's deity. I believe that Jesus was God. That was a big one. That was the last thing I let go of. Is Jesus God. He's the Son of God. Is he God? The Trinity, the Holy Spirit, God the Father. Yeah, I believe Jesus is God or was God. Um <clears throat> but guess what? So am I. Oh my gosh, that's blasphemous. Well, I believe that we're all God. We're all in the image of God, and I believe we are all God. I am an expression of God. Male, female, all of it, right here. And um, the self-love that I, well, there is one form of self-love that I found in the Bible, sort of, is, uh, you know, take care of your body. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. So that's still, you know, it's because of God, right? In between that and me taking myself, it's, it's taking care of myself, it's because of God, right? But um, but no self-love. And really, um, in understanding that I'm God, I'm my own God, and that's okay. And that there are, I believe there's infinite number of gods that are huge. I believe there's a whole bunch of them actually inside me, but okay, go figure that. Um, but the concept of God, myself, that loves myself and makes choices to just be love, regardless of what I do or give or how or what or where or when, just being love, embodying love, that's my religion. Community is my church, my chosen family doesn't have to be an institution anymore. This church of the sacrament. I'm the sacrament. I'm living my body. I'm living my life as a sacrament. As I define it. In my book, there's a chapter. Um, it's being transcribed now. It's not out yet. Next year, hopefully. Called The Bible Box. Where my God used to live. I got in the box. I let God out of the box. And I got in the box. And I've let myself out of the box, right? I lost my train of thought. 
7 billion religions. My mind goes in so many different directions. It comes to Christianity and religion and God and everything, all of this. If there's 7 billion people on the earth, let's say, then I believe there's 7 billion religions. We each have our own religion. Why should I expect somebody else to believe like I believe? Make myself feel better about it? I mean, there's going to be overlap, yeah, but, but we all have beliefs and experiences and it's for me it's fluid and it changes and and I, I learn new things from different experiences and people and places and teachings and and I integrate what I choose into my life choice into my religion the religion of Kelly and really for me Church of the Sacrament is that it's holding a safe container where others can create their own religion for themselves. We have some, we have obviously our bylaws and our core beliefs and mission and all that. Um, and loving ourselves and the world through that and, you know, being kind to each other and, and not crusading and all that. Um, but really, really, uh, by me being my highest self, as I know, and continuing to grow in that, that that inspires others. Okay, cool. Well, I'm not doing it for others. That's great. But I'm doing it for me. And that pleases my God. My God is very, very happy with me. My God loves me very, very much. I am my God. So religion for me is not uh, kind of the binding, uh, limited you know, list of rules that I was raised with and that I led my own family in. No, religion for me is family. It's taking those really cool parts of that I remember from growing up, you know, Thanksgiving, a bunch of families get together at the church in the fellowship hall, like, on a Saturday, you know, and playing hide-and-seek in the pews, you know, and, oh, you want to go up in the baptismal, you know, and, and all that in the dark, and, you know, and the dad's watching the football game in the other room on this little TV, and the mom's all talking, you know, in there, or close to the kitchen where the pie was, and us kids being able to go in there and get food whenever we wanted, and in and out, and I just... Those, you know, a whole bunch of those memories, those were fun times, so much fun. Uh, so I have some good memories. Uh, other good memories, um, the last stanza of, gosh, oh, I don't even remember the hymns anymore, the hymn books, but, you know, on Sunday night. So that means, like, you know, eight stanzas are going to be over, and then we can go, and I can, girls and I, we can go chase each other in the parking lot, or we're going to go to someone's house for for dessert afterwards, and that's fun, you know. The connection, the family, the community, that's what I loved about it. And we had that. So, um, yeah, that's what we have now. And that's, in Church of the Sacrament, that's what, I'm certainly going to continue, and that's what I've been doing with Guava. It's just community, people coming together and being themselves together. We call ourselves family. And I just want to say a note on that. Um, a lot of things are happening, you know, in our world, in our country, in the Bay, in our community, different people, all these different things. Um, you know, some people come to my mind that I won't name that are in, kind of have a, a spotlight shining on them you know, for things that have, choices they made or whatever that are in question. And people have been hurt, violated, you know, boundaries crossed, these kinds of things. And I feel like this whole consent culture, the Me Too, all of this, it's coming up so that we can be a family. If we're going to live together, there's a lot of movement. I'm going this weekend to go to uh, Tribalize, which is... Um, Actually, when you watch this video, we will just finished it. Um, November 3rd through 5th in Sebastopol about building regenerative communities and all that kind of stuff. And um, going there to connect and all that towards a project that, um, for my for Etowah. And 
really the community is the place where if we're going to live together, you know, people are asking, you oh, know, the Bay housing prices, all this stuff. Um, you know, I don't want to, you know, live with my family or I don't want to live, you know, in a retirement home or assisted living or whatever. I want to live out in nature somewhere where we're community, we, we're family, we, you know, or network with maybe other communities, stuff like that. That's the trend. And I'm on that. And if we're going to do that family, whether we're living in homes in urban environments or out in nature or another country, whatever, then we've really got to get along family. We've got to nail some of this stuff down this, you know, major core issues. And that's what's happening. I believe from my perspective. And uh, that's exciting. And to me, it's, you know, just kind of a, uh, to me, it's telling me that we're getting close. There's a big migration to going into these communities. And these are all flowing into that, I believe. But really, it comes back to me. It comes comes to me. Just like, you know, events. We don't have a whole lot of warehouses and stuff like that. You know, do big parties or festivals or whatever sometimes. But we have the homes. And ultimately... It even comes even more intimate into myself, my own spiritual practice, my own Kelly religion, where my God loves me so much. I am so loved and accepted. If I never do another thing, good or bad, or black or white, right or wrong, um, if I never anything, I'm just sucking air. I'm just breathing, right? I'm loved right where I am. And if I'm going to make a mistake or, you know, fuck up or whatever, you know, I'm going to do it really good. I'm going to, and, and I'm going to do it. I shared this with another friend, you know, I'm going to do it well. Um, I'm going to screw up well, but I'm going to, if I'm going to take a detour, I'm going to do it perfectly as Kelly would take a detour. I'm celebrated for being me. And in that environment, I can grow, I can, I can face my shadow, I can deal and make those hard choices with myself. And as I can do more of that, I can do it in any relationship. Any relationship. That's my religion, and that's over nine minutes. Much love. My name is Michael Marinacci. I am a lifelong scholar, independent, of comparative religion and spirituality. The author of California Jesus, and uh, also I'm working on at least two books in similar veins to uh, be released later on. Um, and I've been asked to discuss religion as a subject here. Well, as I uh, said to Kelly when uh, we were first uh, going over the subject, I said, well, really, religion, to me, is very much based in its um, Latin roots, relingus, which means to relink. Uh, we're In religion, ideally, we are relinking ourselves with the divine, whether a force outside of us or a force inside of us. The word has gotten some uh, bad connotations over the last few years, I think, People uh, invariably link it with organized religion, and as I always say, the problem is that anytime you have two or more people that have gotten together to relink themselves to uh, the divine and have a shared definition of what that is and how to get at it, presto, you've got an organized religion. So I'll really move on from there and maybe talk about how I came to study it and uh, involve myself. I was raised basically cultural Christian and secular humanist. My father was a uh, lapsed Catholic. My mom was a back, back, backsliding Baptist. I uh, didn't really have too much interest in religion, spirituality, the divine, etc., etc., until I went off to college and started playing around with various exotic and illegal uh, mind-expanding chemicals and started to adopt, as many people who have a similar path do, a sort of pop Eastern uh, pantheistic um, spirituality. Pantheism defined means that you see God or the divine as 
as completely imminent, meaning it's in, in everything. You're surrounded by it, you swim in it, as opposed to a transcendence, which is God is up there or is beyond your existence. Uh, in college, I was a sociology major, and I began to notice how systematically it was excluded from studies of um, what motivates people in groups. I mean, at the time we were in the middle of the Iranian Revolution, I remember that uh, my classes would discuss it and analyze it endlessly, and not once would I ever hear the words Islam or Quran. And I just thought this was almost like deliberate blindness. So I continued to be open-minded. Uh, I would say that if I had, and to a certain extent still have, a real teacher in this field, it would be the late Robert Anton Wilson, the co-author of Illuminatus, and uh, self-described guerrilla ontologist and somebody who for me really kind of said it's okay to have multiple models of reality. It's okay to kind of switch off between them and be somewhat agnostic about whatever's going out there and realize you don't really have all the answers. I went to see him at a uh, lecture in 1985, a couple of years after I'd graduated college, and he was sort of riffing on various conspiracy theories he indulged in. And he mentioned David Ferry, who's one of the players in the great JFK uh, conspiracy theory, which for obvious reasons is hot again, had been a bishop in something called the Old Catholic Church. Now, my dad had been Roman Catholic, and so I knew some of the basics about the religion. Uh, but I said, what is this? They're Catholic, but they're not, they don't answer to the Pope? This is strange. So whenever I'm intrigued by something, I tend to go research it, which back then, uh, before the internet meant going to the University Research Library at UCLA and delving into some reference books, and suddenly finding there was this whole universe of non-mainstream faiths and cults and sects and weird little groups of every kind of description that I'd never heard about, that had not existed, but were all over the place. And this was very mind-opening to me, again, as somebody who had, had had a mostly empirical and secular view of reality, aside from my, my personal experiments and <laughs> journeys and my so, sort of soft sympathy to people who were of faith. So I began to really look into it and have been doing it ever since, been sort of an independent scholar of uh, compared to religion, particularly non-traditional and non-mainstream ones. And one thing I've always said about it is if you get past the issues of belief and faith and dogma and do you really think this is true or not, et cetera, et cetera, two interesting things are going on with religion of any kind, whether it's the Roman Catholic Church or Islam or some little goofball sect down the street. Number one is they, it's this is how you make tribes. Humans, I've often said, our, our default setting is tribal. We are meant to have extended families. We're meant to be living in communities that where we support each other and have a sort of shared belief about things and shared rituals, shared traditions, et cetera, et cetera. And number two, I really started to see, particularly in the new ones, particularly in neo-paganism, Wicca, some of the Eastern groups that had, that had been imported to the West and were um, kind of taking off in their own directions, an almost kind of performance art you really see this a lot, I think, especially with groups that use lots of liturgy or ritual or symbolism, that this is sort of an ongoing process of creativity and of expressing a creative and essentially artistic um, drive under the guise of spirituality, under the guise of the holy. In many ways, um, I think some of the, one of the most interesting groups I've ever seen is called the Church of Old Worlds, who <laughs> kind of are, are based on the, um, the, a group of the same name in a famous science fiction novel by uh, Robert A. Heinlein called A Stranger in a Strange World. And I was very blown away when I saw them because I said, here's a group that is coming out and admitting it's based on a work of fiction 
and making things up as they go along and are really more f oriented towards the future, towards science fiction and utopian visions than they are towards the, the, uh, the romantic pasts of gods and heroes and monsters and what's, whatnot that, we, um, that most other faiths have. So I just mentioned them as an example. Really through them and through a bunch of other groups that I've studied over the years, uh, in the tradition of the gonzo journalists like uh, Hunter S. Thompson and Tom Wolfe that I admired, as well as my own college disciplines of sociology and anthropology, I've become a uh, something of a participant observer. I've, besides studying the groups, I've participated in rituals, participated in the creation of rites, uh, beliefs, liturgies, um, mythologies, and whatever. Uh, and sort of been able to, to, to look at it from both sides, from both the, the academic and standpoint and the standpoint of somebody who is involved in these, in a, a spiritual community, is involved in a, uh, a vision of the holy, a vision of the transcendent, of the sacred. Um, one thing I've run into with these groups is all of them, you do not use what I call the C word, which is C-U-L-T. Uh, it did not really have a pejorative meaning until around the time of Jonestown, which was such a horror that since the word cult has been attached to that and to things like Heaven's Gate and uh, the Order of the Solar Temple, all these real, uh, very frightening and, and destructive groups that uh, emerge every now and then, uh, it's become something of an insult. So these days you use sect, you use new religion, you use circle, whatnot. Um, so I would, as much as I like to say, well, I'm a student of cults, I realize that with the groups themselves, this is considered an insult for good reasons, and I tend not to, to use it. Uh, most recently, my uh, academic side, or at least my... Uh, non-participant side was uh, involved in the writing of the book California Jesus which is about the Christian groups and evangelists and sects that have either emerged from or settled in uh, this great fair state of ours. Uh, I'm working on another book that's coming up about a very different and much more off mainstream uh, set of spiritual groups and as uh, work progresses on that, I can reveal a little more about it. But really, to me, the most exciting thing of all, and the most creative, and this gets back to what I was saying about, um, about religion as performance art and religion as tribe-making, is participation in the creation and building of a spiritual community with some shared beliefs, with some common practices, with some symbols that can evoke what is um, what is most holy or what is most powerful to the um, to the participants. And in many ways, it just seems more vital than ever because of uh, what's happening in our society, because of the influence of the internet and late stage capitalism and some other factors. Um, we've become very uh, atomized socially. We've become ultra, ultra individualistic. And I think none of this really erases the human need to be part of a group, to be part of a tribe, to have traditions, to have rituals, and to have a sense of the transcendent, the bigger picture beyond our individual lives and our day-to-day -day concerns. Uh, really because so many of the other institutions, i.e. mainstream organized religion, uh, the extended family, traditional neighborhoods, traditional communities have all really, really uh, faded in, in power, particularly among uh, college-educated urban Westerners. Something else has to stand in for that, has to, to take the place of that which makes us truly human and gives us this vision beyond our, our mundane day-to-day -day lives. And I see what uh, Kelly and uh, people like him and the people around him are doing is very much involved in this uh, 
I might almost call it a healing process after uh, being wounded by institutions that failed and living with the, the pain of being so alienated as we are a lot of the time. A healing process is coming back into community, coming back into that feeling of, yes, I belong, and I am a son or daughter of the divine, however that is uh, defined. So that should, uh, that should serve as my introduction. Um, I look forward to seeing this uh, broadcast as well as the other ones that uh, Kelly is uh, disseminating to uh, the outside world and to um, possibly working with uh, him and uh, our um, cohorts in common in realizing a, uh, a divine vision here. Thank you very much and uh, blessings to you. Hi everyone, I trust you enjoyed this month's You and Hellion on the topic of religion. Next month is vision. So what does vision mean to you? Uh, is it uh, your vision for, you know, autop is it autopian? Is it, you know, having vision, casting vision, you know, living life with the purpose of vision or no vision? What does it mean to you? So through your lens, uh, check the Church of the Sacrament Facebook page for dates of when your submissions are due by. And also, by all means, do post your reaction video to this video in the comment section for what religion means to you, because this is an open mic ministry. Everyone has a voice. Everyone's a minister. So please do that. And uh, also in the archives, there last month, for example, last month was community. So you can always go back and, you know, look at another topic and, and uh, you know, share what community means to you as well. So until next month, much love.